Good day, this is Jim Patel from Columbia Gorge Community College. This is Digital Electronics 1. This lecture is entitled Digital Logic Applied to Motor Controls and PLCs. One of the functions of combinational logic that everyone neglects is motor controls and PLCs. And to me, I don't understand why it's neglected because it is, it is the most important, in my opinion, reason why you're learning digital logic. Okay, everyone talks about adders and comparators and decoders and encoders and code converters and multiplexers and demultiplexers and parity generators and checkers. When they're talking about the functions of combinational logic, they even they just neglect, they totally neglect motor controls and PLCs because there's a little secret uh, I have for you guys. Kind of one of the major purposes of this digital electronics class. There are a bunch of other purposes, but it's really kind of preparing you for to understand motor controls and PLCs. It's never expressly stated that that's the purpose because you're all wrapped up in all this computer speak and VHDL programming, but no one comes out to you and explains to you directly, hey, this applies to switches. This applies to motor controls and PLCs. And what I'm trying to do, my intention in this lecture is to, to directly draw the parallels with what we're learning in digital electronics to stuff that you may have already seen before in some of your motor controls courses and what you're going to see in PLC, PLCs. Along with that little secret there, there's a confession I need to, make, need to make. I don't like programming. So I've always associated software programming with those pale Cheeto-eating weirdos that sit inside all day. And when someone first showed me VHDL, I was like, no, no thanks. Okay. And some of you guys might have had that initial revulsion that I had when I, when someone showed you VHDL for the first time. And after overcoming my initial revulsion at it, what really convinced me how incredibly awesome and powerful VHDL is, is uh, you're not programming software, you're programming hardware, it does something. It's physical device that you're connecting and disconnecting inside to perform some function. Uh, the other thing is too, is the ease and functionality of VHDL. We've already shown you major advantages of programmable logic devices over fixed function integrated circuits strictly by wiring alone. In addition to all the added functionality, just wiring these devices up are substantially easier. How I'd like to kind of approach this is just kind of discussion of things you may already know and may have already seen before. And what I'm going to try to do is tie them in to our digital electronics. Before I get into that, why do I have a picture of SDS Lumber up there? SDS Lumber, it is a major employer in my community. And we had the chance to do a tour at SDS Lumber. And to me, it was probably one of the most fascinating tours I've gotten a chance to take with at teaching at CGCC. Again, my background is industrial wind and some pretty high-tech semiconductor industry stuff. So I've always been used to seeing the latest and greatest modern stuff. Touring at SDS was a major eye-opener for me because it is an incredibly varying mix of old technology and new technology together. It's got these huge boxes of relays from the 1940s with 1940s wiring that still working right next door to this latest and greatest PLC controlled laser three-dimensional mapper. So it's this really cool mix of older technology and newer technology. And your understanding of both motor controls and relay ladder logic and PLCs is going to be a tremendous advantage to you in the future. And this course here, this digital electronics course, I know we've been talking about VHDL and all these fancy dancy computer concepts, but what you learn in digital electronics is directly applicable to a company like SDS. Okay. So it's one of all those jack of all trades courses. What I'm trying to do is expressly tie in the concepts we're learning to motor controls and PLC. All right. Switches. You should know a little bit about switches. They're essentially binary devices and they are activated or deactivated. Notice I did not say on or off or closed or open. Activated, deactivated. I have not used the terms on off, closed, or open. These, those are terms that, yes, can be applied to them, but activated or deactivated. All schematics, all the time, are always drawn in the deactivated condition. So what I'm saying is, is in its natural state, no one's flipped it, no one's touched it, no one's fiddled with it. It is in its deactivated state. There are two types of switches, two general types. 
what's called a normally open switch and a normally closed switch in its deactivated state. Again, it's drawn its deactivated state. What is a normally open? The general schematic looks like that. There's no connection. Johnny Electron cannot get from this side to that side because it is open. Whereas Johnny Conventional Current Electron, a normally closed switch in its deactivated state, there is a path from left to right. What happens when a normally open switch is activated? What's it do? It closes. What's a normally closed switch do in its activated state? It opens. In the case of a deactivated normally open switch, there is no current flow. In the state of an activated normally open switch, yes, current flow. Now my question to you, where's the voltage? In an ideal circumstance, perfectly conductive switch, i.e. a perfectly conduct conductive switch with no resistance, regardless of the amount of current through it, there should be no voltage, okay, because V equals IR. In a normally open switch in its deactivated state, depends on where it is, you might see voltage across it. Now, a normally closed switch in its deactivated state, yes, current can flow through it. A normally closed switch in its activated state, no current. Okay, same thing about the voltage, depends on where it is. You may find voltage across a normally closed switch in its open state. You may find float voltage. You may find, and again, in its deactivated state, if it's a perfectly, i.e. no resistance switch, you'll find no voltage across it. And in real world, obviously, you're going to find a tiny, 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 small amount of voltage loss across it. I have just discussed switches in terms of electrical switches. There's another world out there that you might be familiar with because you have gone through hydraulics, hopefully at this point, a normally open valve, a normally open, and it's deactivated state versus it's activated state. What is a normally open, oh geez, normally open, you know, it's allowing flow. So it's an opposite world here. So flow, you know, you think about opening a faucet and closing a faucet, no flow. So there's this entire different world, this electricity, hydraulics. Go back to the hydraulics lectures, review these things, but realize there is an opposite world for schematics. And I know some of y'all's head just exploded. What are we going to deal with right now? We're dealing with electricity. So we're using this definition up here. So that's our basics about switches. There are a number of different types of switches. Think about a limit switch. It's just dangling there, waiting for something to hit it. And that's a normally open, deactivated limit switch in its activated state. What's it going to do? Something's going to bump it or run into it, and it's going to close. There's a normally closed limit switch. And in its activated state, what's it do? Something bumps into it and opens it. There is this thing called the gravity convention that if you could look at this guy, see how the normally open limit switch is drawn at the bottom? So as if gravity was pulling it down. What if, uh, and I said deactivated state, you know, all schematics are always drawn in their deactivated state. What if that normally open switch in its deactivated state, I know it's normally open, but was being held closed? Say, for example, a hydraulic circuit, you know, a, a rod is pulled back and it's hitting that limit switch. It's drawn like this, and this drives me crazy. It's drawn like that. That's a normally open limit switch being held closed. Okay, how do I know it's a normally open switch? Because the limit switch is at the bottom versus the limit switch at the top, according to the gravity. Um, think about gravity. This drives me crazy because it's super easy to confuse these two. They're not equal. It's super, super easy to confuse a normally closed limit switch. You know, think about gravity. It's falling down. It's super easy to confuse this definition or that schematic with this one. Because look at this one. It's the gravity should be dangling that open, but it's being closed. Here's, there's another method of drawing this. What's called, it's just an arrow modifier. So if you see an arrow on a switch that's closed, what that means, it's a normally open switch being held closed. And if you get a textbook, if you get a schematic with that gravity convention and no arrows, first thing you do, go through and draw a bunch of arrows. It just serves to remind you what's going on. Let's do the same thing, the gravity convention for a normally closed switch, because it's at the top, that's a normally closed switch being held open. Yeah, it's confusing, I can't really see that. Just draw an arrow. Okay, so you put an arrow modifier in there. All right, enough about that. Like I said, there are a bunch of different types of switches. There's, okay, so there's limit switches, you got push button switches, 
actually here, that's a normally closed push button because gravity is holding it down. Here's a normally open push button because gravity is holding it down. Those are all for like human interaction. We talked about limit switches. Think about like you got to make a decision off of pressure. There's a pressure switch, a float switch. They're normally closed. This one is normally closed. Temperature switch. Oh, geez, that's a bad drawing. All sorts of different switches. I'm not going to draw every single one of them get used to it. There's a bunch of different types. If you ever see this too, here's a good one. This is something you'll probably run into. It's a mechanical interlock. Those two switches are tied together. So when one limit switch is bumped, you know, it's hitting something, this other switch closes at the same time. It's a mechanical interlock. That's what happens when you try to say two words simultaneously. Okay, mechanical interlock. You may run into that. R switches ideal. Like I said, they are essentially binary devices. They have an activated state or deactivated state. And I'm here to tell you, no, they do not have an ideal state, at an ideal transition. And what I'm referring to is, is bounce. Think of it. It's a physical device. And it, as you slam that thing down, it's going to bounce until it attenuates and comes to rest. So that's what's known as bounce. And if you can imagine, what's going to happen is, is at this time, I make that switch transition from deactivated to activated. It's going to hit, bounce, 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 come back. That's what's known as switch bounce chatter. You're switching high current loads. That's going to be a problem. Your contacts are going to wear out. There's this thing called debouncing, which we'll go into a little bit later because we haven't discussed sequential devices yet. Debouncing a switch does that perfect transition from deactivated to activated and vice versa. So a quick discussion about poles and throws, which is pretty confusing. Then we'll move on to relays. Uh, this is something I always have to look up to, just use the internet, but the what's a pole and what's a throw. First one, S-P-S-T, single pole, single throw. It's like those dip switches that we've been using in some of the earlier digital electronics labs, the pull is the number of moving contacts, whereas the throw is the number of positions per movable contact, whereas a throw is the number of positions for each movable contact. So let's take this guy over here. That's a single pull. That's the movable contact. But it's the number and the throw is the number of positions for for each movable contact. So there's one, two, single pull, double throw. Whereas this guy, double pull, so one, two, single throw. How many positions? One for that one, one for that one. Okay, double pull, single throw. And now let's do the same thing here. Double pull, double throw. So it's one, two movable contacts, but each one has one, two. So double pull, double throw. Pretty easy to confuse yourself on those things. And again, I always kind of have to look those things up and which one are we going to use a lot of this guy right here with those dip switches you should have seen those before single pull double throw those are the slide switch inputs on our we're going to use all these things okay let's continue on with our discussion of relays okay and i certainly hope this is a review for you because if you do not understand a relay you're going to have a tough row to hoe this year so what is a relay okay it's kind of like a switch but it's an electromagnet that turns on or off its switches. If you could think about coil of wire, and when there's no current through it, there's no magnetism. When there is current through it, it kind of creates this magnetic field around. If you use that magnetic field to move something, what you've created is a solenoid. Okay, what are you moving? It's a magnetically magnetically attracted object. And that moving object, that's kind of called the armature. If that armature is tied to some switch contacts, you can create what's known as a general purpose relay. So here's the coil for control relay one, and it's got this set of contacts called CR1A. And what's neat about this is, is you could have a bunch of different contacts. So here's CR1B, and notice how I'm using that designator CR1. It's for that. And here's CR1C. There's the normally closed side. There's the normally open side. When it's the coil is energized, all those contacts change states. Pretty cool, huh? And what this is, what's neat about this, the thing, the circuit that controls CR1, kind of the control circuit, I'm going to call that in green, can be electrically isolated, what I'm going to call the load circuit. So it's neat. You're using potentially low voltage, like 24 volt DC to control like 480 volt AC. It's really cool. So it's this means of 
isolating the control and the load circuits. And you've seen these before. I certainly hope you've seen these before. Well, they're called ice cube relays. Why are they called ice cube relay? Because they look like an ice cube. You can see through them. You can see those moving contacts there once you've energized it. They've got like this socket. It's like an octal base. It's like eight pins to it. And it fits into this socket holder and all your terminals for all those wires are already wired into that socket. And what's really cool is, is if it doesn't work, you pull it out, take a new one, plug it back in. Okay, so just facilitating the repair of that that one device. These coils has a has, a, has to have a minimum amount of current from the control. That's what's known as the pull in. So it's got to have a certain minimum amount of current to pull that armature inside it. And that's kind of like the high logic level in uh, digital electronics. You think about TTL. You're going from zero volts to one volt to two and a half volts, suddenly it goes from low to high. Okay, so there's a transition to a logic level. Once it's inside there, though, it takes less current to hold. And that's what's known uh, as a Schmidt trigger in digital electronics. I know we haven't gone over it just yet. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this in a little bit. There is also what's known as a dropout. And I'm not talking to those guys that didn't show up after week two of Digital Electronics 1. I'm talking about dropout current levels. There's a certain minimum amount of current. Once it's in there, it's got to hold it. And below that certain minimum current level, it falls out and goes back to its unenergized state. What happens to your contacts? They obviously flip-flop back to its deactivated state. That's kind of like your low logic level. So it's got to have, so now you're at 5 volts and you go down to 2.5 volts and you go down to 1.3 volts. Suddenly, is, I don't know where that transition is, it goes from high to low. Okay, so there is these minimum pull-ins and drop-outs and kind of that transition region between them is sometimes referred to as hysteresis. Uh, I'm not going to spell it. Hysteresis. And that's Go, again, go back to those hydraulic videos there, the video lectures, uh, specifically pressure switches. That's got a pretty good description of hysteresis. Like I said, there's an isolation between the control side and the load side. You know, it might be 24 volt DC, whereas that thing might be, the load side might be 480 volts AC. Obviously, these load side contactors have to be designed to carry large amounts of current, whereas this guy does not have to have such such a, a high grade to it. What is a contactor? Okay, a contactor, it's a relay. And everyone thinks it's different than a relay. It's really a relay. All it has is just high current capability and overload capability. Overload, here, let me draw one. Okay, so here's a contactor. And what I've got here is, it looks like it's switching a three-phase AC motor. Like I said, here's our load side. Here's a, an auxiliary contact if we potentially want to switch something else. Here's my kind of my control side, 24 volt DC. What are these guys right here? Those are overloads, ele overload elements. And what those things are is they're thermally activated and they've got the matching thermal characteristics as that motor. Okay, so obviously the motor higher current, it's going to heat it up. And at a certain point, it's going to start undergoing some less than desirable changes. And what you try to do is you match those overloads to thermally, thermally mimic that motor. So when the motor is heating up, the overload heaters are heating up. And then what happens is when they heat up to a certain point, those things open up and the motor shuts off. It's not really a circuit breaker because again, they're thermally mimicking it. It's a thermal mimic. And you can, and what's going to happen is, is the motor cools down, the overload contactor, the overload elements cool down, and they will reconnect. You can trick it to reconnect. You can purposely reset those things or reconnect those things. Do you want to? Well, because that motor is still hot. That is, again, it's a means of protection. You don't want to go ahead and somehow circumvent that. Protective relays. Protective relays are cool. Protective relay. You all are familiar with a circuit breaker, okay? opens in an overload condition. A protective relay is something different. It needs to be told when to open. And you could have an entire course on just in protective relays. But how or what I'm trying to do is tie in those digital electronic concepts to protective relays. Okay, it needs to be told when to open. What's really cool is, is there is a bunch of different ways you can use protective relays. Sensing over speed, under voltage, over current, instantaneous overcurrent versus time 
over current. These are all inputs to a potential digital device that is making decisions upon those and then opening or closing those protective relays. Okay, like I said about bounce in our switches there, again, bounce is defined as that chatter. Same thing is going to happen with those relay contacts because they are physical devices. They, they chatter. What if you could create this device with no moving contacts, no moving parts? It's an SSR, solid state relay. What does that thing look like? Perfectly off to perfectly on to perfectly off. What is that? It's a thyristor, my favorite device, uh, SCR sometimes called. These things are light triggered. Ask me about SCRs and thyristors. I will talk your ear off about these things. It's pretty neat. You don't have that physical chatter anymore. That bounce is lost. They're debounced devices no moving parts to wear out, no moving contacts to, to corrode. Uh, again, ask me about these things. I'll talk your ear about it. We'll go visit the, uh, the Solalo DC, excuse me, high voltage DC converter station, and we'll see how these SCRs are actually applied and they're light triggered. Pretty cool. All right, let's move on to ladder logic, kind of the heart of where we apply our digital electronics theories to motor controls and PLCs. Okay, ladder logic, again, I certainly hope this is a review for you. Uh, traditionally, we can draw a schematic like this where there's, let's say it's a 24 volt DC source. Here's a fuse, there's a switch in series with, let's say a lamp and there's a ground. I can draw it like that and that's totally fine. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call that L1 and this L2, these are wire numbers, by the way, and that's wire one. I could just as easily redraw this schematic in what's known as a ladder logic format. And there's the ladder logic format. Let's call that a switch A, and there's a lamp one. What's L1? That's the hot. What's L2? That's our ground. When I activate switch A, lamp comes on. All it's doing is showing me the same information in a more compact form. Which side do I put the switch on? The one I've just drawn is what's known as a high side switching versus low side switching. Yes, it'll do the same function. My question is, is which is safer? So I'm gonna draw a low side switching in both the traditional schematic and the ladder logic schematic. Okay, this is my high side. And what I've done, that's the same schematic we've done. That's its ladder logic. Here's a low side. It's kind of the same thing, but look at the order in which these the lamp B and switch B is. See if you can come up with the ladder logic equivalent of that. It should look something like this. There you go. Functionally, they're gonna do the same thing. When switch A is closed, what happens to lamp A? It lights up. Okay, there's a path from high voltage DC or a higher voltage DC to ground. What happens when I switch switch B? Well, there is voltage. All it needs is a path to ground. Once the path to ground is made, what happens to lamp B? It lights up. Functionally, they're performing the same thing. My question to you is, is what's the wisest way of doing it? All right, let's say a piece of wire accidentally falls. What's the easiest way to do this here? Let's do the let's do the high side to show you what would happen in a in how people normally do this. Okay. Let's say a wire that's connected to ground accidentally falls right there. What would happen to lamp A? Well it's got ground on one side, it's got ground on the other. There's no potential difference. Okay, it's not gonna light up. Okay, and let's say that's a, a motor. That's probably a pretty good idea. A motor's not just gonna suddenly start if there's an accident, accidental short to ground. What happens if someone closes the switch when there's an accidental short to ground? I mean, think about here what happens. Will that motor light up? Look at this. That's a 24 volt DC on this side. Zero ohm fuse, zero ohm switch to ground. 24 volts DC to ground. What happens is high current, the fuse melts the motor still doesn't turn on, or the lamp in this case doesn't turn on. It's not working because of this problem here. But notice at no time did that motor or this lamp in this case suddenly start up. Let's say that light is controlling an optically coupled SSR. You don't want that light to show to accidentally start up. Now watch what happens, the same thing, the same wire, the same accidental short to ground. What happens here? Okay, there is voltage. And now there's a path to ground. What has the low side been waiting for? It's been waiting for a path to ground. That motor starts up or that lamp starts up without switch B being closed because there is now a complete path to ground. What happens And you know, think about somebody in a panic situation, suddenly that motor starts up, what are they gonna do? 
well, geez, the switch is hooked up wrong. What am I going to do? I'm going to close it to see if it turns off. Or and I don't know what somebody's going to do. You're going to do a whole bunch of panicky things. What happens that switch do? It does nothing. So high side versus low side. Some, and I'm saying that there, yes, there is a major safety advantage for a high side switch. There may be applications where you want a low side switch. Be aware of potential problems with that. How are ladder logics typically drawn? This way. Okay, your output device is right there. The relay, let me just, uh, again, this should be a brief review to you. A relay, how is a relay used? Here's my L1 upright or rail, and here's my rung for CR1. That's the coil, and here's switch A. That's just the coil. The coil controls CR1A, its associated contacts, because it's coil CR1. It's part of that control relay one. And let's say that controls a lamp. Whoops lamp. And in this rung, its associated contact CR1B is actually normally closed. And here's lamp B. My question to you, this is drawn in its deactivated state, which lamp is on? And the answer is this guy. When switch A is switched from its deactivated state to its activated state, what happens to CR1? It energizes and changes the states of its associated contacts. CR1A closes, CR1B opens. Now which lamp is lit? There you go. Using the coil of that relay, we can control other rungs, other branches of logic within there. Pretty cool, huh? How do I apply ladder logic to our digital logic? All right, for lack of a better word, easiest description to understand this is, is series connections are ands. Parallel connections are ors. Normally closed switches are not and I can use a coil to invert the output. Okay, let me write that summary, and this is just general rules. There's a general rule. Series and parallel or normally closed connections are knots, and I'm going to kind of use these in combination. I'm going to use the control relay and the coil to invert the outputs. I'm going to show you guys how that's done. Okay, so let's take each one in series there. And our series connection, this is what is known as a permissive or a safety chain. One of the devices I used to work on in my career had 138 elements in the safety chain. Talk about an AND gate with a lot of inputs. Um, and I may have already done this in one of our previous lectures about AND gates. A switch in series with B switch. And here's my output device. It's a lamp or whatever. Real brief thing about the output. Okay, I'm defining my output for this ladder logic portion of the lecture as it activates something. That's a one. And deactivate, you know, the output, if it's deactivated, the lamp is turned off, that's a logical zero. It could be a motor or something like that. It depends on your definition of the output. Same thing for my input. In its deactivated state, I'm giving it a zero. It's a normally open switch. What's it do? Well, it's, I'm giving it a zero. It's open. Activated, that's a logical one. I'm activating it. What does an activated normally open switch do. It closes, and we'll go into the knots here when we use normally closed inputs. Permissives, safety chains. A and B must be closed for lamp X to turn on. Imagine switch A and B are replaced with the following. There you go. Here is a float switch, temperature switch, and a limit switch. A float switch has got to be like enough liquid. A temperature, it's got to be uh, below a certain temperature. Uh, the limit switch, uh, the door has got to be closed for this particular lamp to turn on. If I activate the float switch, i.e. give it a one, will that thing turn on? No. I close the door. Will the thing turn on? No. It is the correct temperature. Will that thing turn on? Yes, because there is a path, a complete path, from left to right, that device will turn on. It activates, okay, as an output one. Pretty cool. It's a permissive, a safety chain. How do I make this more safe? Put another device in series, like another pressure switch. Everything has to be true. Any one of those elements becomes untrue or deactivated, the device turns off. It goes to a logical zero output. One quick note on the AND gate about wire number. We'll come back to this. L1 to A. One side of A, one. One side of B, two. One side of C, three. Back to L2. And we will come back to this. Imagine the wire numbers I had if I was to have 138 of these things in series. We'll come back to this. Okay, imagine making a modification to 138 different types of wires. Maybe there's something out there, i.e. the PLC, that could potentially simplify this. So let's move on to the OR. OR can be generalized a parallel connection of switches. Imagine L1, A, 
in parallel with B in series with our output. If A is activated, there exists a current path from L1 through A to our output device. It turns on. If B is activated, current path, the device turns on. If A and B are activated, there exists two current paths. The device turns on. If I wanted to go ahead and turn the device off, if I turned off B, I would have to turn off and A. So welcome to negative logic. Your head is exploding here. So I have to turn off A and B to get it to turn off. That's negative logic. But again, what was our truth table? A, B, output X. There's output X. Both deactivated. No output. What did we do first? We did A first. One, zero, zero, one, one, one. Output, output, output. What is that? It's the OR. Okay. Quick note about wire numbers. Again, what is that? That's L1 going to the left side of A, L1 going to the left side of B. Well, it's this. This is wire number one coming from the right side of A to the right side of B to the input of our output X. So those wire numbers, they're electrically common. I could have an, any number of wires coming from wire number one. And ideally, they're all that puke green color I just, I just used. It doesn't have to be the same color, but it's highly recommended, highly, highly recommended to keep the same colors for those. Okay, what is the pink wire? That's L2. Again, you can put a hat on your foot, but there are far easier ways to do this. Stick with the same color. All right, so if ands are in series, ors are in parallel, check out the not. Okay, use a normally closed contact. Again, a normally closed condition, that's our input A. A is be get, being given a zero because it's not being activated. It's deactivated. What's my output X? It's on. That lamp is on. That motor's on. So my output's one. When I activate A, what does a normally closed switch do? Opens. So I activate it. When it's open, what does my output X do? It turns off. Pretty neat, huh? Now, uh, using what I just said about this guy and the, let's run we do it first here. Using what you know about the not gate, using it this way, can you make for me a NAND? And what I'm going to do is give you a hint. Make a NAND using its negative logic equivalent. It should look something like this. So NAND, what is it? It's an AND gate with its output inverted. And I know we have not shown you how to output invert yet. What I'm saying is, is use the negative logic equivalent. What's the negative logic equivalent of a NAND? It's a negative OR. It's an OR gate with its inputs inverted. Okay, check this out. How do I do it? What's an OR gate? It's parallel connection. Here's my output. What's the input happening there? Excuse me. What's the input? What is happening to the input? It's being inverted. So use a normally closed connection. That's A. That's B. What is the output for a NAND gate? It's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. The output is low when both inputs are high or all inputs are high. What is the output for this circuit here? A, B, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Output X. Okay, output X. We are neither activating A or B. So we're in this state right here. What is my output? Well, there certainly is a certain path. That thing turns on. One. Okay, I'm going to activate B. So what does it normally close switch do? It opens. There still exists a current path. Now I'm going to go ahead and activate just A. There still exists a current path. Now I'm going to activate A and B. The thing turns off. Pretty cool, huh? So and I haven't even shown you how to form an output inversion yet. What I'm using in this particular example is the negative logic equivalent to make, in its deactivated state, a NAND gate. See if you can come up with a NOR. Make a NOR gate using ladder logic, using its negative logic equivalent. That is a homework problem for you guys. Now, let's move on to how to perform an output inversion. Okay, like I said, use the general purpose relay coil and normally close contacts to perform an inversion. All right, there it is, there it is written out, and what I'm going to do is draw my rails or my uprights, L1, L2. Let's say I want to make a NAND, but I don't want to use the negative logic equivalent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an AND, A, in series with B, and what is the output for this one? The coil of a control relay. I'm going to call that CR1. What I do is I take one of the associated contacts with CR1. Let's call it CR1A. It's obviously different from this A. Okay, it's like a push button or a limit switch or a float switch or a pressure switch or whatever. And I use the normally closed contact side of it. And here's my lamp, my output or motor or whatever it is. Okay, in a de-energized state, what is that lamp doing? It's on because there exists a current path. Okay, so in its de-energized state, A, B, X, 
A and B are deactivated. What's my output? There is an output. Go ahead and activate B. What happens? Nothing happens because there's no current path to the coil of CR1. Now, let's flip-flop it. Let's activate A. Still no current path to CR1. CR1A still stays closed. Finally, we're going to activate both A and B. Now, there's a current path from here to there. CR1 energizes. What happens to CR1A to its associated contacts? It switches to its opposite state. The lamp turns off. What's your homework? Make a NOR using the relay coil and a normally closed contact. How to form more advanced gates? Think about the exclusive OR. What does an exclusive OR look like? What's its symbol? A, B, output X. What is the SOP expression for an exclusive OR? It's not A and B or A and not B. Do you think you could take this expression and put it in a ladder, lo ladder logic format? There's our rails or our uprights. What's an OR? What I'm referring to is, is take this OR with that. It's a parallel connection. Let's use color. What's the expression in yellow? Well, it's an AND. It's a series connection, but one of them has a negation bar over it. What's a negation? It's a normally closed contact. A, B. What do you think this guy looks like? Well, it's the exact opposite. Well, not the exact opposite, because it's still a series connection of inputs A and B, but in this particular case, is B is being inverted. How does this thing function? Okay, in its deactivated state, A, B, output X, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. What am I going to do here? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm currently in the deactivated state. Johnny conventional current electron gets to here and up, oh, can't make it, gets to here, can't make it. What's the output? Zero. Now I activate B. What happens in an activation? Changes the state. There you go. I'll put one. I'll leave it to you to go ahead and perform the truth table evaluation for the other two cases for that. All right, and additionally, you should be able to take the expression for an exclusive NOR. You can do it in two ways. Uh, let's see, ladder logic, expression. Basically, take the expression. What is the SOP expression? It's called the SOP expression. What's the SOP expression for the exclusive NOR? And there's a second way to do that. Just invert the output of our ladder logic exclusive OR. How would you do that? Potentially using a relay and a normally closed contact. Go ahead and see if you can do that for a homework exercise. Okay, let's finish up this particular lecture with uh, bringing it close to the PLC. Your Obviously, hopefully well-versed in relay logic and motor controls because that should have been a refresher for you. And again, what we're doing is preparing you for this course in PLCs and PLC applications. And if I could just use one of these analogies, like leaf is to the tree, like the feather is to the bird. Fixed function devices in digital electronics are like relay lot in motor controls. The PLDs, the programmable logic devices that we're learning to use in and particularly the FPGA, the Field Programmable Gate Array, that's kind of like the PLC. What is a PLC? It's Programmable Logic Controller. And in the old way, what I would have to do, or well, not the old way, it's predecessor to the PLC, because there's still applications, like I just said, at like SDS Lumber, motor control right next to PLCs. Let's say I've got A, B, and C. I would have to physically wire those things up in a physical arrangement. In this particular case, what is A, B, and C doing? It's forming the OR gate function. And I would have to have wire L1 and wire 1 and wire L2. In a PLC, it's this magic box. It's not magic. That has inputs going to A and B and C. And here's my output. And there's a program in there that says take input A and OR it with input B and OR it with input C. OR, that's kind of a text space, and I know that's not the syntax for it. There's graphical, believe it or not, ladder logic editors. These are really cool because people are so familiar with seeing ladder logic that allow you to configure A in parallel with B, in parallel with C, to make output X act like if it was an OR gate. Input A is activated. Input A is activated. What happens to output here? Okay, it's, it's pretty cool. It's performing the OR function. And you might not see a major advantage to this thing until the following happens. Your manager comes to you and says, hey, I want you to make this an AND gate. I want you to make this an AND gate. Well, let's go try the motor control example. Disconnect A. Add a wire to, or actually one in this particular case. One to B. Add another wire to, to C. 
add another wire, three to whatever output device is, and that's back to L2. So you've added two more wires, and you've taken the time to do that. It's physically disconnecting, adding, and or connecting again. What do you do for this one? Go to your computer, change A, B, C to act like an AND gate, download it, and don't do anything with the wires. Now, go ahead and test A, no output, A, no output, B, no output, B, no output, C, output, C, output. It's behaving as if it was an AND gate. How many wires did I change in this way? Zero. The number of wrappers that are better than Tupac Shakur. Now your boss says to you, hey, oh, did I say AND gate? I meant A and B or C. What am I going to do? A, unwire it, rewire it, B, in parallel with C. What do I do here? Don't do anything to the wires. Make a program that does this. Download to the PLC and inputs A, B, and C. Perform as if they're doing the following function. It's a major advantage of programmable logic versus typical fixed function relay logic. I don't have to rewire these devices. I still have to have those wires going to those inputs. One, two, three. You know, in the particular case of the device, I worked on 138 inputs for that safety chain. Yes, I'm going to still have to have 138 inputs. But if I, and, I, and it was gross oversimplification about that, um, that all being an AND gate. Let's say if I wanted to go to an AND with some ORs, I would have to switch within those 138 wires, potentially a bunch of wires. Whereas if I have a PLC performing that, yeah, I've got 138 inputs to it. All I got to do is change the program. So what I hope I did in this lecture here is showed you one of the major applications of combinational logic that unfortunately a lot of people overlook. It's the control of motors using motor control, traditional ladder logic, switches, relays, and PLCs uh, using some of the digital electronics techniques that we've learned thus far. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, let's go into some of the more traditional functions of combinational logic, namely adders, comparators, decoders, all those other toys.